Welcome everybody to our today's event. Um, my name is Lin Zhang, Zhang Lin in Chinese way. I'm Associate Professor of Chinese History at Boston College. Um, I've been uh, acting as the convener of this research series called Environment in Asia uh, for the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies ever since 2012. So this is the fourth, uh, no, 12th year of our research series. So thank all of you, both those of you in person here in this room and all the audience online for supporting us over a long decade. So we cannot work without you. So I would like to talk all of you to say, hey, hey, continue supporting us. Come back to our next event, which will take place on Monday, Monday afternoon. That will be April 29th. That means the week after next. Uh, Four o'clock to six o'clock, we will have another talk uh, featuring uh, Professor Hua Yi Cheng, uh, who is a Buddhist scholar at University of Arizona, who recently published two books, both on animals and Chinese religion, specifically with Buddhism, I suppose. So Professor Hua Yi Cheng will give his talk on April 29th, and Professor Brian Lander, who is an environmental historian at Brown University, will be joining us uh, for that event to serve as commentator. So, all right, so here here we are, without further ado, let me uh, quickly introduce it today and um, today's event. So let me uh, put out some house rule first. So we, um, you are all aware we are doing this hybrid uh, uh, event. So we will have, um, we, we do have our um, audience online and this event is recorded. So, um, and we have a three discussants who currently are joining us online and you cannot see them, but actually they are there. <laughs> so, so our today's event will last for about one hour and 15 minutes, supposedly two hours. We will be Begin the event with a um, book talk from Professor Timothy Brook. Uh, that will last about 30 minutes, and then I will bring in our three commentators to discuss it, to join us to offer their discussion. And then we will move on to a um, maybe 15, 20 minutes um, um, interaction between Professor Brook and our three discussants. And then only after that, I assume will be 5.20, 5.25, we will open up the floor for everybody, both all of you in this room and our online audience to participate <laughs> in open Q&A. Everything will be recorded, so I just want to remind you that. Um, all right, so this is the structure. So I would like all of us to remain relatively quiet during the process of uh, uh, book talk and the exchange between Professor Brooke and our three discussants. And wait, if you have questions, any thoughts, questions, comments, please wait until around 5.20, uh, 5.25 for the Q&A. Okay, great. Excellent. All right, so let me um, thank Professor Timothy Broker for flying all the way from the West Coast <laughs> to join us today to give a talk about his most recent book, The Price of the Collapse, The Little Ice Age and the Fall of the Ming China. Um, and I I see several books already laying out on the desk because that means many of us have already been reading or already finished reading this very, very exciting book. So we, we're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, Professor Tim C. Brook is someone I don't think uh, needs introduction at all. Most of us in this room have been reading um, many, many of his books. So, so uh, let me still try in a few short sentences just to mention um, something, um, uh, just a little bit of his uh, marvelous achievement. Uh, Professor Timothy Brook is a historian of the late imperial China with focus on Ming China, but his expertise and also his writing practice has extended to different time periods uh, through entire late imperial uh, era and all the way to contemporary modern China. So his been writing about uh, Mongol, Mongol Yuan, and he's been writing about uh, uh, World War II, Japan, um, and uh, Japan, uh, uh, Sino-Japan War. Um, and his uh, research also has gone beyond the main China or China overall in the past decades. He's been writing consciously 
for the world history and the global history. So his readership has extended way beyond the narrow field of Chinese studies. Yeah. So um, uh, I would like to quickly mention three realms for his uh, uh, expertise and his writing, uh, the focus of his writing. One is the social and cultural histor uh, history of the Ming Dynasty. And then the second is a modern era, the Japanese occupation of China. And then the third thing, uh, very importantly, um, is he's been writing and studying historical perspectives on world history and also many issues in association with human rights. Um, um, uh, Professor Brooke is one of the most erudite scholars and the most prolific writers of our time and his He's authored, single authored, co authored, and edited, uh, edited um, two dozens of uh, titles. And I don't think I need to mention all of them, but I want to mention several books. Um, he's single authored, authored a book that um, I think uh, has influenced me um, to a great deal. Most recently, um, his book, uh, Great State, China and the World, has been uh, illuminating writing for me. That was published in 2022. And his book, which was published in 2013, Mr. Sheldon's book, A Map of China, Decoding the Secrets of a Vanished Cartographer, has been used for uh, in my classroom for my teaching. And I just learned about 15 minutes ago from Professor Brooke, he has just finished a brand new book is associated with Mr. Seldon's map. So he's going to perhaps tell us a little more about that. Um, uh, several years before that book, 2010, um, he published a book, The Troubled Empire, China in the Yuan and the Ming Dynasty. And then before that, in 2008, Here's a book that was really a global uh, bestseller, which were, uh, was entitled Vermeer's Hat to the 17th Century and the Dawn of the Global World, which was read by every single global historian, world historian in my department, I would like to say, and many of my students. Um, before that, 2005, um, the Chinese state in Ming society. And then in 1998, the multiple award-winning book, The Confusions of Pleasure, Commerce, and Culture in Ming China. And for those of you who have read this new book, you must have noticed that Professor Brooke actually uh, referenced his old book, The Confusions of Pleasure, many, many times. Uh, beyond his single author book, he has edited many, many important volumes so one of them um, uh, is entitled The History of Imperial China. That is a six-volume edited book published here by Harvard uh, University Press. And Professor Brooke acted as the editor-in-chief. So um, with all these um, very simple uh, uh, um, uh, information, I think I don't need to say more, you know, far more about this scholar and writer through his writing, his, through his, uh, through his uh, uh, teaching. So now today, let's welcome him to our room to speak to us about this brand new book, which I just finished reading, which is excellent. So, Professor Brooke. <laughs> Thank you all for coming, and uh, thanks in particular to Ling for inviting me to become part of our environmental history series. I'm not an environmental historian. I'm not a climate historian. I'm not an economic historian. I'm just a China historian. <laughs> but as a China historian, my work over the last two decades has led me out into a sort of global, a sort of global framework for thinking about China, and that's drawn me into areas in which I have no competence whatsoever. But if you do a little reading, you can sort of bone up pretty quickly on, on some of the main concepts at work. And my work is, I've been drawn out of my sphere of confidence into, into zones that I know nothing about, but I find it's interesting with my knowledge of Chinese history to go into these new zones and see what can be discovered. Now, I started working on prices, main prices in the 1990s. I, this was when I was working on Confusions of Pleasure. I wanted to not have an idea of what did it cost to live in the Ming Dynasty? And I was so frustrated at not being able to find any decent data about prices. But since the 1990s, I've been collecting data on prices. And I found it in three areas. One is randomly cited prices 
in uh, the writings and jottings of Ming writers in BG. The second place is in government documents, and usually the prices there are prices that a magistrate either paid or set as the amount that should be paid if his underlings were going to be buying any, anything on the local market. Then the third that came along are the prices to which grain rose during disasters. And these are recorded in local debt reports. <laughs> and um, by European price history standards, none of these, none of this, none of these data sets are any good because they're not, they're, it's, it's hard to create a kind of consistency of data with the exception of famine grain prices. And um, so uh, my project during COVID when I was stuck at home and with nothing else to do was to write an enormous manuscript on Ming prices. I got to the end of it. It was large, unwieldy, and utterly boring. <laughs> and I decided, no, I'm not gonna publish that. So what I should do is go to my best data and build a book around that. And my best data are the prices to which grain rose during, I was going to say during climate disasters, but I shouldn't prejudice that. I'll just say during disasters. Prices are really important, not just for the survival of ordinary people, which was the subject that sort of was sort of drawing me to prices, but they're important because they are connected to heaven's oversight. Heaven provides the temperatures and precipitation that are necessary to produce abundant crops so that people can prosper. And then heaven withdraws temperature and rainfall um, when it is unhappy with either people or their ruler. So prices have a um, have a have large role in Confucian cosmology, although it's not really thought that much talked about. But a price crisis is taken to be a moral warning. Now we too take climate disruptions and skyrocketing rocketing prices as warnings, and in our case of environmental degradation and climate change. Even though our moral calculations are differently based, we do not stand at all that great a distance from the people of the Ming as they watch the price of grain rise out of their reach in, in moments of particular crisis. Now we conceptualize the world as a physical ecosystem that is vulnerable to distortion. They conceptualize the world as a kind of metaphysical board game in which heaven was the main player. And they had to um, they they had they had to do their best to act in a way that heaven would give them the rain and the warmth they needed for their crises. That was something something sorry something happened to my um my PowerPoint here anyway. These are the topics that I'm going to talk uh, be talking about today, and I wanted to start uh, by saying that as a social historian. I was inevitably drawn into climate history because that's what my data was going to talk to me about. And I, I needed to appreciate the data on its own terms. <clears throat> so it's what this has led me to the Little Ice Age. Now, the Little Ice Age, you'll all be familiar with the Little Ice Age, of course. This is a, a single screen to capture and, and uh, encapsulate that. The Little Ice Age was a term co coined in 1939 by Francois Mattes, a Dutch-born glacier specialist, to describe the findings of the Committee on Glaciers of the American Geophysical Union. And it was, they were studying moraines in the Sierra Mountains and came to the conclusion that those moraines were the result of glacial activity over the past 4,000 years. Well, that, he called it the Little Ice Age. We now refer to this as the late Holocene period. And the Little Ice Age was then moved to talk about um, the cold phase in the 16th and 17th centuries when alpine glaciers in the European Alps advanced rather than receded. And we have, of course, tons of great um, visual material for this. I'll give this painting by Hendrik Averkamp, uh, a, a Dutch painter showing everybody out in the snow skating around. Or Sebastian Ranks's painting called War Plundering, um, which is directly connected to the stress of uh, an environmental difficulty. So, um, <clears throat> subsequently, 
the Little Ice Age was then expanded and goes back, is usually now taken to be a period from roughly 1300 to 1850. And the thing about the Little Ice Age, it's not just that it's a period when temperatures are colder, but when they become more volatile and uh, it becomes very difficult to, to, to sort of predict what's, what's going to go, what's going to happen here. So what caused the Little Ice Age? Well, um, solar radiation was cut. Air, there was aerosol blocking due to volcanic activity. This resulted in lo local in colder temperatures, which in turn provoked changes in air circulation and ocean circulation, resulting in the collapse of predictable precipitation. Now, according to the European evidence, the Little Ice Age deepened in the mid 15th century during what is called the spur of minimum from 1450 to 1550. It eased in the mid 16th century, then it deepened again in the late 16th, plunging into an even colder phase in the 1630s and 1640s, leading to what is known as the Maunder minimum starting around 1645 and going to about 1715. Now, some um, more sophisticated environmental historians than I have criticized the concept of the Little Ice Age as an ungainly abstraction that's too broad to tell us anything. Well, that's not my concern. My concern is not to absolutize the Little Ice Age, but to globalize it and to take it out of its, its home origin in uh, the Northern Hemisphere, the Western world and the Northern Hemisphere and see how it applies elsewhere. And, um, how widely the Earth experienced the Little Ice Age is a subject I've discovered as of some debate. Some climatologists insisted it was uh, exclusive to the North Atlantic region. Others have been willing to take a more expansive view and suggest that, in fact, it infected the entire Northern Hemisphere. As late as 2019, some continued to insist that, quote, the Little Ice Age wasn't global. So a science journalist who used this phrase in 2019 did so to press the point that current climate change is global and the Little Ice Age wasn't. Um, uh, th that's not an issue that I find of any particular interest because my findings, as you are, you're about to see, my findings are going to line up with the European record remarkably well. So, um, I first became interested in, in the climate deviation in the 2010s. I published the, an essay in 2017 in which I did the standard thing of taking documentary proxies. So using dynastic histories, uh, provincial gazetteers, and tracking periods of warmer and colder uh, temperatures and periods of, of richer precipitation and deprived precipitation. And um, this, is a, this is a chart I put together that I, that I still largely um, uh, find useful. And if we take a look at it, I mean, it's, it's pretty clear what's going on between, um, what do I start? I started in 1260 and run it to 1644. China during these years was a colder environment than it had been. And it became, and so that's below the, below the dividing line on the top graph. And then if you look at the incidence of what's above the line on the second graph, it became drier. And this becomes the deadly combination for Chinese agriculture when the temperatures fall and drought rises. And um, there were two particular periods that, that I found intriguing. One is this period from about 1450 to 1510. And this is a period when <clears throat> temperatures generally are colder, not exclusively. There are a few warm years uh, in there. And pre precipitation uh, declines, although there's a few, uh, a, a few well-watered years in there as well. But it's this combination of cold and drought that become very difficult. And um, what sort of knocked it out of the park for me was the fact that this crisis starts in 1450, which is the beginning of the Jingtai reign. And Jingtai, Emperor Jingtai is eventually um, uh, overthrown uh, after ruling as emperor for seven years because of the discontent being caused by the climate crisis that 
he was presiding over. And then finally, um, the last block from 1637 roughly to 1647, uh, this is a period when China is exclusively cold and exclusively dry. There isn't a wet year, there isn't a warm year uh, in the late 1630s through the early 1640s. And this became um, the focus the focus of this book. Um, so um, the pattern of precipitation, well, I, 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 I won't, I won't uh, bore you with the details, but um, if, you, if you look at, well, if we look at the first century, um, well, the first half of the Ming Dynasty, there were 46 dry years and 26 wet years. So China isn't being entirely dried out uh, during this period, but it gets very severe because between 1544 and 1644, China experiences 14 years of wet weather and 31 years of dry weather. Then, um, but you have to overlay this with temperatures because the uh, Chinese agriculture has learned to deal with drought, to store water, to, to direct water in ways that will enable crops to, to flourish. But it's when temperatures fall at the same time that the, the, the combination is just deadly. So my, my, my findings were that when those two factors coincided, uh, Chinese agriculture was under severe threat. Um, now, we have all of those famous paintings of the Little Ice Age in Northern Europe. I, I then started looking around for paintings that might show similar conditions in China. It's very hard to do so because Chinese artists tended to work within a kind of tropic language in which snow represents purity. So just because there's a snowfall doesn't mean that you're, 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 you're representing a world that has gone colder. And yet, to my unprofessional eyes, you can't paint a snow landscape if you haven't seen one. And the interesting thing about this painting by Dai Jin that, that, that is on the front cover of the book is that he painted in, in 1445. That was the first year of this long run of cold weather that set off the Jingtai, what I call the slough, the Jingtai slough of the 1450s. And so I think uh, Dai Jin was, um, he was experimenting here because he'd never seen such snowy landscapes before 1445, and he painted this. Um, this is a, a, a more different, uh, I don't have an exact date for this painting, so it's a little frustrating. Um, I've just called it winter landscape. Um, when it was, uh, when Bonhams put it on the market, uh, uh, in well, it was in 2002, and then they re-auctioned it in 2017. It was called viewing the winter landscape. And it, of course, it's supposed to be a scholar viewing the purity of winter and you know appreciating the purity of winter. But again, if Zhang Yichi hadn't seen a winter landscape, how could he have come up with this? But I'm, I'm not going to press this part, point too far. And uh, uh, art historians can take me to task for it. Um, a particularly good visual representation of, of a climate-induced uh, harvest crisis is Yang Ming's album that he had. He didn't himself uh, uh, produce the album, but he wrote it and submitted it to the emperor, to the one the emperor in 1594. And this is in the wake, the late 1580s were a period of severe crisis, agricultural crisis. Um, for the Wanli reign, uh, China recovered about eight, uh, 1590. And then in 1594, it looked like it was starting again. And this proved to be a very effective uh, tool by sending in this, this, this portfolio of what's going to happen if uh, uh, agriculture isn't rescued um, was enough to motivate the Wanli emperor to actually raise funds, distribute it, and relieve the family in Hunan. Um, Chinese artists generally don't like to paint inauspicious scenes, but um, this was not a case, a case of that. This was simply a case of trying to get the emperor's attention and, and it worked. All right, now I'm going to get to my documentary proxies for this project. And that's the, those are the prices to which grain rose during crises. And I, I started, 
I, I think I, I first noticed this maybe around the year 2000. Um, searching for price data, I started finding grain prices in the, uh, in the section of gazetteers that list auspicious and inauspicious events. Um, and, but in every case, no, not in every case, but in most cases, if a gazetteer lists a price, it's because the price is so out of whack with what the price should be that it becomes a historical marker for moments of crisis <coughs> in, uh, in the local gazetteer. So I've at random chosen uh, this Neishang Senju from the south end of the North China Plain uh, because it was so full of, of great data. Now, the normal, uh, these are all copper prices. The normal copper price for um, a dough or a peck of grain is about 25 to 30 coins. And here you can see what's happening. So in Wanli, uh, uh, Wanli, yeah, one me 18, so what's that, uh, 1590? The price has risen, and, and it says, Mi Jia, Tung Yung, it's shot up, or it's it's soared to n over 90 coins for a doh. And then by the first year of Chongzhen, so we're at 1628, it's 160. Uh, by Chongzhen 8, so 1635, it's gone up to 200, then it goes up to 500, then it goes up to 720, then it goes up to 1,200. And to just turn the page here, um, by the end of the Chongzhen era, that is by the end of the Ming, it's grown to 2,600 coins for what, you know, a bountiful harvest, you'd be paying 30 coins for it. You're now having to pay 2,600 coins. And then it goes up further to 3,600. So this, to me, became fascinating data. It's not transaction data. It's not saying Mr. X paid 3,600 coins for, this, for these 10 liters of grain. Um, it's a historical record designed to highlight the scale of the catastrophe. And the nice thing is that it's quant it's a quantified scale. Um, prices are, are prices are numbers in relation to other numbers. Um, so I started collecting this stuff. And every time I wandered into a library, I'd go to the gazetteer section. At random, I'd pull gazetteers off the shelves, uh, turn to the auspicious and inauspicious uh, section. Usually it's chronologically, chronologically arranged as it is in this case of this uh, of the Nacho uh, County Gazetteer, and I write down the prices. And in the end, I managed to acquire 777 uh, disaster grain prices. Um, oh, and another source also in, also in Gazetteers were essays. And sometimes in the uh, auspicious and inauspicious events section of a Gazetteer, you, the editors of the Gazetteer would include essays by people who are reporting disasters. And this is the essay with which I open the book. And it's uh, a series of two essays by Chen Xide, who's just a, an ordinary schoolmaster in Hongxiang County. Um, no one of any particular note, but he, he, he pays very close attention to prices when he writes. And it's his way of quantifying the experience. So. And um, his prices are in silver. So we switch over to silver prices. It's three to four fun. So one, uh, three to four hundredths of a tail of silver will buy you one dough of grain. And in 16, 1589, it goes to 16 fun. The early, in early 1640, it's, it's down at 10. By late 1640, it's up to 20. 1641, it goes from 20 to 30. Then it rises to 40. And in 1642, interestingly enough, there is no price because there is no grain. There is nothing that anyone can buy. There is simply no grain, so there is no price. So these are the kind of data that I started gathering together. And then I started to assembling them in, an, in a, a long Excel file, which um, someone at the Max Planck Institute converted into a, a completely, to me, incomprehensible program 
uh, a data program that I really can't manipulate at all well. But you can see what I've done. I've, I've, I've registered the year, the county, the province, the condition, because often there is a condition listed driving the price up at this point, and then I give you the source. So 777 prices, and they expand rapidly over the course of the Ming. So for the Jingtai period, which is when the Jingtai Emperor is overthrown, I've only got 20 disaster prices. For the Jiajing area, I've only got 43 prices. But down into one, the, the, in the 1580s, I've got 87 prices, 1610s, uh, it, it dwindles. But in the Chongzhen era, I've got 248 disaster prices. And this in, in turn becomes in its own way, a kind of useful statistic because the rate at which these prices are reported is reflecting the desperation. They distribute um, fairly widely across the country. There's a, a big concentration in Jiangnan, which is where the droughts and colder temperatures, well, the droughts in particular are, 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 are felt. Um, there's also a certain concentration up in the Northeast because that's where the colder temperatures are playing. And then, um, as you can see, they're scattered all over the country. And I really couldn't do much of a geographical analysis. I leave that for somebody else who wants who wants to do that. But if I give you this uh, this chart, this is just the uh, the last fifty years of the Ming Dynasty. The bars are showing the number of disaster prices that are reported, and then the red line and the blue line are showing the prices to which uh, rice and wheat rose uh, during that period. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, the um, the impact of the last six or seven years of the Ming Dynasty is just extraordinary. Grain is unaffordable. The prices shoot through the roof, and disaster prices are reported all over the country. All right. Well, let me now step back from my data and talk about climate as history. And I've got four, if you like, loose conclusions. The first is that China was subject to the same larger climate chain trends as Europe was through the period of the Little Ice Age. So the Little Ice Age was global, not only in, ex in its extent, but in its effects on people. And um, the effects were, were, were a little different. As I, I read in, in European climate history, it was the work of Emmanuel Leroy Laroid that made me, he, he concluded that the impact of the Little Ice Age on Europe was that it was a combination of colder temperatures and excessive rainfall. China, it's very different. Colder temperatures and scanty rainfall. And that had to do with the way in which winds and ocean currents circulate. So Europe experienced the Little Ice Age as wet, China experienced the Little Ice Age as dry. And that contrast is a useful one to think about in terms of building up a kind of global history of the Little Ice Age. Now, my second general conclusion is that the Little Ice Age compromised the capacity of Chinese to survive. And it did so in China to a degree quite as severe as in Europe. So we have we have these, uh, this drawing from Yang Dongming's album of uh, uh, somebody feasting on a corpse, which was the only food that he could lay his hands on. And, um, and I, I end the book with this, with this uh, price list that appears on a stone stele, or it appeared on a stone stele outside a temple in, in Huazhou in southern Shanxi in 1643. And the, it, there, it starts with a poem evoking the uh, tragedy of the moment, but then he just gives a price list. I mean, a peck of rice or millet, 2.3 tails of silver. And it had cost three one hundredths of a tail of silver when, when prices were normal. And, and then he goes down a peck of wheat, 2.1, peck of barley, and he goes down. Uh, and even a peck of chaff will still cost you a tenth of a tail of silver. Um, and that became the way in which uh, this author, who's, who's now anonymous because the part of the, the steely with his name on it got shipped off at some point. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't know who, who wrote this, but 
what I want, I include this because it's something that was keenly important to the people of the time. This is how they were experiencing the crisis of the late May. Uh, they weren't worrying about Manchus coming across the border. Well, they might have been worrying about Manchus coming across the border, but they were worrying about how am I going to get enough food to, to survive? So that's my second, uh, my second uh, conclusion. My third conclusion is that these events came with political consequences. So I'm giving you that Sebastian Brank's painting again, uh, chaos as temperatures fall and harvests fail. And arguably you could say that the same thing is going on in China, that the Ming fails for reasons of uh, insufficient supply of food caught, brought about by the climate conditions of the late May. Now, my fourth conclusion is that the Ming collapse, um, uh, the Ming survived for three centuries through the Little Ice Age. And this is a kind of testimony, I think, to the, the stability and the viability of Chinese institutions for dealing with dearth through granary systems, irrigation systems, um, the, uh, the, the genetic manipulation of crops so that they harvest early, they could be harvested early and so forth. So in fact, China showed remarkable resilience in the face of this, but it's when, uh, to, such that if, if it were a two or three year crisis, the, 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 the dynasty does not fall and uh, people are able to survive. But when you get to the late 16th, early 16th, early, and early 1640s, it goes on for six or seven years. And there's just all the resilience has been removed. So let me conclude by saying that the, um, I'm not, well, and this, this is where I, um, I, I will face off with the charge that I'm, I've written a book that is a climate determinist. And I don't think I have. I mean, uh, the Ming collapse can't be completely explained in terms of climate change. But if you don't bring the climate in, you can't explain the fall of the Ming. Or if you do, you resort to the Qing narrative. And the Qing narrative, which Dorba established right after the fall of the Ming, was that, oh, you people are corrupt. Um, your emperor was OK, but the generals were useless. Your officials were lining their own pockets. Um, you Chinese are just so immoral and licentious, your dynasty fell. Well, it's nonsense. I mean, it's, 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 the, it's true. The <laughs> but no, not true. I, I, would say, I would say not true. Um, but it's the, it's the convenient narrative. And, and Chinese intellectuals all signed on. They said, oh, you know, yeah, we, we, we screwed up, we failed, and so we will now serve our new masters. So it worked beautifully for regime change, and um, the Manchus were brilliant in manipulating this, this ideology of moral failure. But, and that then goes back to this whole question of prices. Why did prices rise? Was it moral, the moral failure of human beings? My answer, well, I don't live in the 17th century, I live in the 21st century, and my answer is climate change. So I will finish there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Tim. I'm just going to be informal here. Now let's just switch our screen to bring about our um, three discussants. So let me very quickly introduce our discussants for today who kindly agreed to form a um, discussion panel um, uh, uh, and share their reading experience of this new book. Um, so um, uh, three of them first, let me introduce uh, Ian Miller. Ian Miller, many of us are very familiar with him. He was uh, trained here at Harvard and he is uh, currently teaching at St. John's University. Um, Ian um, studied with uh, Michael Zoni and Michael Zoni studied with you. So I feel like there's a strong <laughs> <laughs> um, Ian's research interests are in the long-term interplay between changing ideas, changing institution and changing environments, especially in Southern and Central China, 
It's also interested in the use of uh, digital texts and tools to explore new methods for writing history. And since you earlier mentioned the database, and Ian is a database expert. Ian is the author of the book entitled Fur and Empire, the Transformation of Forests in Early Modern China, published by University of the Washington Press in 2020. He is currently writing a book, which is a history of the connection between family institutions and village environments tentatively entitled Ancestral Shaped Kingship and Ecology in Southern China. Our second discussant um, is uh, Yan Gao, uh, who obtained her PhD from Carnegie Mel uh, Mellon University. Uh, Yan teaches at the University of Memphis. She was a Rachel Carson Fellow at the Rachel Carson Center in Germany, and she also conducted her postdoctoral research at the Mark Planck Institute and also Duke University. Yan specializes in social and environmental history of a central Yangtze region, um, in, um, in water history and Asian environmental humanities. Her first book was published by Brill in 2020. It's entitled Yangtze Waters. Um, her, current, uh, her current research project explores the interactions of social and climate systems in the central Yangtze Valley from the 19th century uh, to the early 20th century, and she is a native of Hunan. Um, our third discussant is a Clark Alejandrino, um, who um, uh, got her, his PhD from the East Asian Environmental History at Georgetown University. Uh, uh, Clark is currently teaching at Trinity College. Um, Clark specializes in environmental history of China, especially its climate and animal history. Interesting combination. And uh, covering uh, her, uh, his research period, he covers a very long period from the 5th century all the way to 20th. 20th century. Clark is currently finishing a book manuscript, um, a manuscript on typhoon in the history of the South China coast, and he's uh, also preparing a new project exploring the history of uh, uh, migratory birds in East Asia. So uh, I'm going to ask our three discussants to just follow this um, uh, order, Ian first, and then move to Yen and the Clark. Each of you are going to have uh, seven to eight minutes to share your reading experience and comments and questions. All right, so I'm first. Can, can you hear me? OK, good. Um, thank you so much, Ling. Um, and also thanks to Mark Grady for your usual and underappreciated organizational magic. Um, thank you to Timothy Brooke for a really exciting and fun book. Um, I have some critiques, but I really enjoyed it enormously. And I think it's an immense contribution to the field. And while I am a historian of China, I've also found myself becoming more, you know, teaching a lot of world history. And I want to use this framework to start with a big question. And this question is, where does climate fit, not just in history, but in historical narrative? And so I found myself last fall teaching a class focused on the Little Ice Age and actually the great drought as well, which is maybe how it was experienced in the Southern Hemisphere. And it was one of the worst experiences of my teaching life. Um, and I, I was engaging in self-criticism and trying to figure out why this was. And I think it's in part because historians have a hard time narrating climate change. And so when historians have traditionally dealt with climate, it's often dealt with as a setting. We can think of Fernand Braudel's sort of famous use of climate to set the boundaries of the Mediterranean, um, or the way it's used, especially in a lot of inner Asian scholarship to sort of set the boundaries between China and inner Asia. But when climate changes, what do we do about that? And how do we narrate that? So incidentally, William Shakespeare lived during the Little Ice Age, and he used climate in at least two distinct ways in his plays. In The Tempest, a, stor a storm sets the stage. And so it's a one-time event that changes the setting and throws the characters together in different ways. And they have to sort of work their way out of this. Macbeth offers a different model. Climate appears personified in the characters of the three witches. And every time they enter, there's a, you know, there's a weather event and they repeatedly intervene in human affairs. And so I think that in my reading, many of the most convincing studies use climate change in the mold of the tempest as a change in the basic constraints 
on human existence that forces them to renegotiate. Sam White has shown that climate precipitated the Salali Rebellion in the 1590s in the Ottoman Empire. Bradley Skopic demonstrates that a series of pluvials in colonial Mexico led to fundamental shifts in land use. And according to recent research, Mongolia went through first a period of drought in Genghis Khan's youth when everything was sort of in chaos, and then a period of unusual warm and wet temperatures during the apex of his reign. There's actually also climatic readings on the Mongol retreat from, from Hungary and from Syria. And so do these change the way that we interpret the significance of the Khan or the Khans as singular individuals? Or does this help us set the stage for the well-known dramas of Temujin's conflicts with Jamuka or Ogade falling off his horse and there being a Khuraltai, which has to now resolve this succession dispute? Um, I think that fitting climate in as a recurring character is harder to do, especially when the narrative is well known. So Jeffrey Parker's Global Crisis is a really seminal work in climate history. And yet the meat of it is essentially a retelling of some relatively well-known historical episodes like the Thirty Years' War or the English Civil War or indeed the Ming-Qing transition with climate now slotted in as a character. And for all of its significance, I find that it tends to bog down with the need to insert factoids about bad harvests or about lakes freezing over into otherwise well-known narratives. Um, it feels, I mean, while I find it convincing as a work of history, it feels in the reading almost like the remastered versions of Star Wars with unnecessary CGI characters inserted among the familiar drama oh. of Luke and Leia and Han Solo. Uh, you can disagree with me on that. But, um, but and I, I feel like this was my students' reaction to it as well. And so this brings me to the price of collapse, where I think we come close to a third model of climate narrative. And so in your familiar style, um, you offer us a sideways glance at the late Ming crisis from a seemingly minor cast of characters. And what these informants tell us is that while the Little Ice Age did precipitate great displacements and wars and starvation, and while the years were unusually cold and dry, the crisis was first and most often experienced as a perversion of prices. And, um, and so I think that really gives us insight into sort of how it was felt and experienced at the time. And so through the eyes and pens of some of these other informants, we get as close as we're likely to get, I think, to understanding the household budgets of both the rich and the poor, what money could buy, and these are really, I can't stress how useful these chapters are. I anticipate assigning them all the time. Um, if you'll permit me a final literary reference, they remind me of the best chapters in the Game of Thrones, which are somewhat lost in the HBO version where <laughs> characters ride through the countryside and, and sort of experience the effects of warfare on ordinary people. And not incidentally, Game of Thrones is also sort of a book about, or a series of books about climate change. Um, so I, I find the prices and especially the famine prices is a highly useful experience of the um, index of the experiences of what the crisis felt like. And it gives, I think, a better sense of the stakes of climate change than a lot of the scientific narratives. My students certainly understood that better than all these discussions of volcanic aerosols and El Nino. Um, we had this recent experience of the social disruptions of COVID prices which were at worst, what, a few dozen percent above normal. And so that nonetheless helps us think through what it would feel like if staple prices were 100, 200, 1,000 percent above the old normal. Um, but this does also bring me to my first critique, which is that prices are notoriously complex. So previous scholarship, in addition to the decadence that you alluded to, um, have also ascribed the fall of the Ming to a crisis of the money supply. And I think that your data usefully dismisses this as the primary factor, but I don't think that it necessarily eliminates it as a secondary contributing factor. And there are multiple other potential confounding factors that affect grain prices. So to climate and the money supply, we might add the well-known late Ming epidemics, disruptions in shipping, especially along the Grand Canal, um, uprisings, and a variety of other ways that these sort of overlap and reinforce one another in complex ways. 
And so while they're flawed, the Ming um, data on climate and grain prices are sufficient to promote to, to allow, I think, more rigorous statistical analysis that will help us sort of hash out which of these contributing factors are more significant and how they may have interfaced with one another. Um, as you as you report, um, there are a bunch of nonlinearities in how grain prices respond to supply shocks, but there are also multiple possible supply shocks. Climate is not the only one, as we know from our recent experience um, going through COVID. Um, more broadly, um, so I, I think I've already drank the Kool-Aid on climate. I find your four final points incredibly convincing, and I find your analysis of the six sloughs or the nine sloughs, if we include the UN, um, moderately so. And um, so certainly the, we have these two crises in the Ming that coincide with, coincide with a spur minima, um, minimum in the 1450s and then with the Maunder minimum in the 1630s and 40s. Um, but the practice of lumping together multi-year segments is not a particularly rigorous way to analyze this, especially without comparison to other climate data. And we do have a lot of other climate data, um, including ice cores, tree rings, um, lake sediments, to compare to the, the, the reports in the gazetteers. And so, for example, a recent multimodal analysis only provides strong support for three of the six sloughs. Um, the, the Jingtai, the second Wanli slough, and the Chongzhen slough. And so there's some sort of discrepancy between the way that these changing climates are experienced or recorded versus the way that they appear in other proxies. And I think that that's a really important issue to try to dig down into. And so I think that I'm close to my time, so I'm gonna close with this. It's clear that prices matter, even to social and cultural historians and certainly to environmental historians. And in fact, grain prices, as you argue in your conclusion, were the device by which the relationship between solar energy and human demand were mediated. But prices mediated other things as well, including some of the things that you list as forms of response to climatic stress, like changes in infrastructure, changes in institutions and technologies, and in particular, demographic shifts. And so for better or worse, these multifactorial relations are often be beyond the comprehension of our historical informants. And so we need to do something else with them. It's our job as historians to render these complex situations comprehensible to our readers. And so we have to craft new types of narrative. And I don't think the Tempest model of climate narrative is up to the task. I don't think the Macbeth model of climate narrative is up to the task. I think the Chun Chida model is getting closer, but I think that there is more that we still need to do as historians of climate. So I will end by thanking you again for a wonderful and provocative book and um, look forward to what the other discussants have to say. Thank you, Ian. Thank you very much. I, really, I want to quickly for me to say I really appreciate Ian by bringing up the narrating, the ways in which how to narrate this. And we see not only the price history, talking about climate history, we see the artwork that Tim presented to us. And now you are showing us all, all this literary histories between uh, from, from Shakespeare all the way to Game of Thrones. I feel like we are bringing multi narrative kind of a regime into studies of a climate history. Thank you so much. Yen, please. Yeah, thank you, Lin. And uh, uh, yeah, I really appreciate Ian's comments and very insightful. And I agree with you on many fronts, actually. And uh, and I really appreciate bringing the many of the uh, the literatures and the, the game of the throne and uh, um, yeah, the other and Shakespeare's quote. And uh, so uh, literature definitely, I would think it's a, it's a very uh, rich uh, uh, pool of source and to look into uh, for the climate analysis. Um, so uh, I would like to, uh, well, thanks to the Fairfax Center and thanks to Lynn and first and uh, and all. And I would like to also thanks to Tim and for writing a, a fascinating book. And uh, I will share a few. And uh, unpolished thought and on the book, and it is very rich. And certainly, I needed to go back and to read it and again and again. And I have re really enjoyed it. Um, and found it is very in in innovative and uh, provocative. Uh, well, the book shows uh, 
force team's um, exceptional strength and in detaining uh, the commercial culture and the social history of them in China. And uh, the narratives are very compelling. And though it is full of uh, the price data and the use of data blends very well and with the narratives and the amount of work being done in constructing the price history and the, from local gazetteers is daunting and the scope of the work is very uh, admirable. So historians have long discussed the digital ice age and its impact on the uh, human society. And there is copious scholarship uh, on the digital ice age, mostly on the European societies. And however, the scope of the digital ice age was global. And as Tim has shown in his book, the clim climatic changes associated with the Little Ice, Ice Age had profound impact on the collapse of the Ming Dynasty. In this sense, um, I would say Tim's provoking study and set an example of researching uh, the Little Ice Age and its impact in Asian and the global context. And the main innovative parts of the book is using uh, deviant grand price data as the climate proxies. Ting has done exceedingly well uh, in reconstructing the price history and revealing the social experience of, uh, of climate change. And as he humbly acknowledges uh, in his own work, as Tim argues in his book, uh, the unusually surging grain price correlated with the changing climate, and especially in the last few years of the Ming Dynasty. To extrapolate the effect of the climate change on social conditions, Tim set out to chart the everyday life of the common people during the Ming and through meticulous studies of the price of goods and the labor and portraying a very vibrant and sophisticated and commercial society and the uh, later downturn of, of this society. Um, so as meticulous and detailed as Tim's analysis, the price data has its own weaknesses as I, Ian has pointed out. Um, the price reflect a bundle of social relations and from market supply and demand and into social political institutional in interventions um, and adjustments and these fluctuation might not be solely caused by climatic factors and for example if we talk about famine yeah so the price and price fluctuation related with famine and the famine could also be caused by uneven distribution of the grain supply among different regions and among different social groups and um of course it remains debatable and is if it's caused by the harvest failure and um many other conditions so we could use more discussion on defining and refining um the, the price regime discussed in the book. I also like um, how Tim start with Brodel's term to understand the limit of the possible and which emphasizes the constraints of environments, he especially knows by the climate on the condition of the society. And um, I would want to know more about the environment yeah, from angry ecological, um, systems, the hydraulic systems, the forest management, mining instructions, etc. And uh, those would help us understand the environment and what limit or during the time period. In fact, the list of prices of various uh, things is ranging from the textiles and the foodstuffs and to porcelain, furniture, and many other things. And it just contains bountiful ecological information. And that already shows the rich environment in people in which people lived and thrived on. And more discussion on the environment would provide a, a more nuanced uh, analysis of the environmental constraint of the late Ming society, as well as the people's agency um, in adaptation and, and, and the survival. 
So Tim's work um, undoubtedly, certainly will sparkle many of the future works uh, based on my uh, kind of some of the, um, um, well, <laughs> understanding of some of the concept that have been mentioned, however, have been not dealt um, deeper into in the book. For example, uh, the Magellan Exchange. So I have seen very recently uh, a rising uh, scholarship on the Trans-Pacific uh, Ecological Transformation and the Magellan Exchange and following the classical concept and the Columbia Exchange and it could be a new topic for many of us to delve into. And the Pacific is a vital space for contact of exchange and was the greatest obstacle for the movement. So for plants and the peoples and the goods and ideas until the, the middle of 16th century. And so the new world, crop, crop, uh, new world crops enabled China's rapid population growth since uh, the 16th century and China's demand for silver transformed uh, the colonial Latin America. So these trans-Pacific biological exchanges, which um, team has started very well and, and analyzed, analyzed the silver flow in a global context. And uh, so uh, in the short term, the long-term perspective and it deserves more scholarly attention and will entail more scholarship to grow and to thrive. And um, well, at last, I would also like to uh, say a few words about the, the collapse and narratives. Yeah, the book, the title collapse of uh, um, uh, the price of a collapse. Yeah, the book adopted the collapse narratives and it shows a dynasty in painful decline. Um, and which could be seen as um, another work and in a in a genre in the trend of uh, the end of the world vision and and um, apocalyptic uh, apocalyptic uh, narratives and and this book is more about um the collapse and it's uh, it's a uh, it's a uh, and with a note on the resilience of the society, as it shows and the ten mentions and, uh, in, in the talk, previous talk, and the surging price regime and continued into the early Qing period and ushered in the era um, of reconstruction and the prosperity and until the end of the 18th century. So what mechanism of the society constituted the resilience of the society and to restore and to recover. And it's something that probably we can talk more and think more on about in our uh, future research. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you, thank you. And uh, let, we, uh, then now we can bring a uh, clock. Hello, clock. Hi, um, can I share a presentation? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, uh, I've gone ahead. Uh, so my uh, thank you to everyone. Um, I echo my the gratitude that my fellow discussants have for Professor Brooke, for Ling, and everyone else, Mark Grady, who organized this event. Um, my fellow discussants and myself are all environmental historians of late Imperial China, but I'm probably the closest to climate history. So I'll limit myself to the ways I think Professor Brooke's book speaks to the field uh, that field, both Chinese climate history in particular and climate history in general. So climatic explanations for the fall of Chinese dynasties has become its own industry, but it is often thin on explanation between adverse climate shifts and dynastic collapse. Um, I would, and a lot of this seems to echo earlier work that uh, one would find um, unacceptable or, or, or even racist such as the Pulse of Asia by Ellsworth Huntington. And uh, the same is true elsewhere uh, in many other parts of the world where we where climate history is done, uh, this kind of obsession with climate to explain the fall of empires is not unique to China. However, I would argue that nowhere else have scholars shown much enthusiasm for climatic explanations 
um, of the rise and fall of empires than in the Chinese field, China field. Uh, the linkage uh, between climate and political and social economic upheavals, if it is real, requires detailed explanation of the pathways by which adverse weather undercuts a political and social economic regime. This is what Professor Brooke aimed to provide with this price data on the late Ming. 777 famine grain rice reports called from around 3,000 local gazetteers, supplemented with price information from many other sources. I think Professor Brook is most convincing in his temporal argument that the late price surge of the Chongzhen's reign was the radical departure from what had come before. I don't think I've encountered of late too many historians who would narrate the fall of the Ming during the Chongzhen's uh, slow, like an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Uh, most would include climate failure, but not give it primacy in their explanation. I have encountered people who give climate primacy, but do it in unsatisfactory and simplistic correlations. It is to Professor Brooks' credit that I do feel more confident about telling my next Chinese history or climate history class that I think price data and the human stories that accompany those prices can provide that linkage that illustrates the pathways that link climate and political and social economic upheaval. Uh, here, I just want to insert a comment that if my two discussants sound a bit more critical than I am, it's because I probably uh, are, am sick of simplistic correlations. And I'm, I think Professor Brooks' book is a huge uh, bread of relief. Um, to, to my mind, this is the most satisfying explanation I have to date of how climate was a tipping point that made the fall of a dynasty as irreversible as any moral detail could imagine, as Professor Brooks says. If, as you say, the ghost of environmental determinism lingers just outside your analytical door and it is not a ghost that you're prepared to deny, I think your ghost is more material and tangible than any that have knocked on previous doors. In this spirit, I do have a question for Professor Brook. Uh, historians of China have done much to move us away from the cycle of the rise and fall of dynasties. But climate history, even when it's, it is done as well as you have, seem to bring us back to these old cyclical patterns. Do you think there's a way we could and should write climate history of such China that go beyond these old paradigms that want to continue hunt, hunting us? On the spatial scale, as someone who is working and calling for local and regional histories of climate, I heart Professor Brooks, Brooks' remarks about how climate is simultaneously local in its manifestations and global in its overall capacity and trends, and why regional climate reconstructions for a zone as large as China is essential for refining and, improve, and improving our knowledge of climate change. And one of the key problematics of the book was how to scale the regionally and individually disparate price histories you had to a national dynastic level. Here, I am interested in how hunger and desperation from climate-induced famine translates into rebellion. Um, I would say this is easy to understand in the abstract, but never going to be quite clear in the details. I think it's interesting that with perhaps the exception of Henan, which you say comp comprised 9% of your data, other hotbeds of rebellion in the late Ming, such as Shanxi and Sichuan, were not well represented in the available data. One always wishes we had more data from such pro from these provinces, and I make this comment more as observation and lament rather than criticism. On the use of prices as climate proxies, sorry, this was this slide for that, the provinces, and uh, on the use of prime prices as climate proxies, I felt as I was reading the book, uh, it reminded me of Lillian Lee's use of prices for understanding the connections between market, weather, state, and society in Hopei. And in particular, her conclusions about how even in a place like Hopei, well-connected, well-supplied, and even in times when it wasn't cold, that the prices of uh, wheat were very much sensitive to drought, I think uh, actually supports uh, what you were saying in, in, in the book about the correlations between cold and dry weather with uh, uh, rice prices. It also reminded me of uh, this debate uh, that once occurred. Uh, uh, two prominent historians of famine, Morgan Kelly and Cormac Ograda, once used wheat prices, price series, to argue that the Little Ice Age was not as important, and maybe even not non-existent uh, in early modern Europe. And of course, Sam White has provided a very robust rebuttal of the, the that, that argument. But reading your book did remind me of the way, ways in which prices can be used for different reasons uh, in climate history. Uh, 
I want to zoom out a bit to consider the bad stretches of the Little Ice Age elsewhere, such as this, uh, such as in France, Scandinavia, Scotland, and other places uh, in the late 17th century, where no rebellions of note took place. Uh, Geoffrey Parker, in the, his book Global Crisis, made a sweeping case for the Little Ice Age as a precipitator of political violence here and there around the world, piling up cases, accumulating examples of where bad weather and violence overlap. But what is the connection exactly, and how can we detect it? I think detailed price series might well be the best we can hope for, and I think that is what Professor Brooke offers. Uh, to conclude, when I first stumbled into Ming history as a grad student and uh, in the University of Sydney, uh, and I went into Helen Dunson's office and asked her if she could teach me Ming history, she told me to start by reading three books, uh, Ray Huang's 1587, a Year of No Significance, John Dardess's A Ming Society, and Professor Brooks's Confusions of Pleasure, which you brought up in your presentation. And, and it's, as Ling said, is often mentioned in the book. In Confusions of Pleasure, you once said that the book was not an economic history of the Ming dynasty. That is not yet possible, but a cultural history of a place that commerce was remaking. In Price of Collapse, you said that the kind of history you offer in this book focus, focuses more on understanding Ming society than Ming economy. I'm really glad that you've never been quite able to write that Ming economic history you first set out to write, for it has led us down some much more fascinating paths. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much, our wonderful panel. And now we're going to turn to Professor Brooke. And, uh... Well, um, thank you. You, you. you three are the generation for whom I've written this book. Um, I, uh, and you, you've all raised points that I think are what the next step of this research should involve. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, I've just given you. I've just given you what I've found and the data that that I've collected, but I'm not going to go on and build a more sophisticated environmental history of the Ming or necessarily um, link my logic, the, the logic of my argument, to the multiple logics that you've been suggesting um, are needed. I, I agree that that all of this is needed. Yes, for, first of all, prices are complex, and um, chap the middle chapter of the book, which deals with what I call the Magellanic Exchange, is there to argue that there is no, I mean, what it became a kind of truism uh, um, among certain people that the main collapsed because of price inflation. And I don't think that's true. Um, the prices that inflated, I mean, the inflation of art prices, prices is never going to bring down a regime. But the inflation of grain prices is. And where does that price inflation come from? And it isn't from the silver coming in from the new world. The silver coming in from the new world had some impact. Um, but I devote an entire chapter to that to try and set that aside as one of the problems that we need to deal. Now, and I, I agree, prices are complex. It's partly why I gave up writing this big manuscript on main prices that I was writing, because it was too complex for me to handle. And I'm not an economic historian, and I will never write that economic history that you don't want me to write. <laughs> uh, I'm not trained for it, and it, it, it doesn't appeal to me. I mean, what, what, what drove this book is, it's really the writings of Chen Shida. And I think I first encountered Chen Shida in Frederick Wakeman's book on um, uh, the Great Enterprise. I think that's what, where I first found Chen Shida. Or it was either that or Helen Dunstan. I don't remember who, whose whose work first introduced me to Chen Shida, and that's where I'm 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 more interested. I'm not interested in great long term trends. I'm interested in how people survive in the conditions that that they face. And so that's in terms of narrating the fall of the Ming. All I want to do is bring climate in as part of the story that we tell. I'm not saying that the Ming fell because of the climate conditions. I'm saying that the resources available to state and society in the 1640s were not sufficient to be able to prevent the collapse of the agricultural economy. And 
and which is so different than the world we live in today. We don't live in an agricultural economy anymore. Yes, we rely on food. And yes, if our food supplies were all cut off, um, uh, it, wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a happy situation. But in an agricultural economy, it's the, the price of grain is the most fundamental economic fact. That, and, and no matter how complex prices are and how affected by exchange rates and so forth, um, it's all minor compared to the, 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 the reality that sits at the center of the story, which is ordinary people couldn't afford to buy grain. Um, oh, you, you all raise so, so, many, uh, so many interesting uh, points that I don't think I can, I, I can answer them all. I'm glad um, uh, both Ian and Clark brought in um, Jeffrey Parker's book, Global Crisis, which um, which I loved. I thought it was a great book. And um, it's telling the history of the 17th century from a perspective, and a perspective that is saying, you can't leave climate out of the stories that you tell about 17th century European history. Well, in the same way, you can't leave the New World silver out of any history you tell of the 17th century. There's so many things we need to bring in as historians, and some books are going to focus on them. I mean, and Jeffrey's been uh, criticized for, for overstating the scale of the crisis. Um, and there were parts of Europe that managed to, and parts of East Asia that managed to survive through the crisis in, in ways that, say, England, Germany, and China failed to do. Um, but it's, it's simply a matter of making, I, I, we just, as historians, climate has to be there. It has to be one of the players. And if our students don't get it, well, I mean, it's, it's up, us to, up, up to us to figure out how do, you, how do you narrate, say, the execution of Charles I without bringing in the climate? And uh, traditionally, that's what we've done because the English, like the Chinese, write moral history. Everybody writes, everybody has written moral history for centuries. And the English version of the death of Charles I is a highly moralized account. And, but without climate, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's inadequate. You need, to, you need to understand the conditions under which ordinary people live if you're going to narrate a period in, in history. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not a fan of, you know, great men and great women in history. This is to me not a way of narrating anything. It's just a, it's just a lot of nonsense, nonsense to keep teenagers preoccupied. Um, hence, hence Game of Thrones. I mean, yes, Game of, Thrones, Game of Thrones is, in fact, if you want to read it that way, it's about a climate crisis. But um, you have to be alert to that. And it doesn't take away from the other stories to, to put it in the climate context. Um, now, um, I thought Clark's point about climate change doesn't necessarily need, need to lead to violence or regime change, it's absolutely true. And the Ming was under particular pressure along the northern border and with the, the rebellions that were rising in Shanxi in the late 1620s, 1630s. But those rebellions and the, the southward push of the Manchus and those rebellions, you leave out climate from saying, well, why did the peasants bother rebelling? Why did the Manchus want to come south of the Great Wall? Well, they didn't have enough food north of the Great Wall. They had to come south of the Great Wall. And you leave that out and you, you turn it into a, 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 a morality tale. And, um, and I'm not so interested in that. Now, what I hope I've done with the book, and I have to, I have to admit, I wrote this book really fast. Um, I won't tell you how how fast I, have, <laughs> but I have this this unmanageable manuscript, and I just ripped it apart, jammed it together, and sent it off to the press. And um, so it's it's a uh, it's uh, a kind of more it's a morally irresponsible book. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you should see the list of errata. So wait for the <laughs> wait for the paperback. And I'm, I'm going to correct all the things that I that I messed up on, on the, because I wrote it really quickly. Um, but I just wanted to get this perspective 
out there as part of how we as historians of China look at the unfortunate history of the Chinese people. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's an essential part of the story and it's not determinist, but you leave it out and you're telling, uh, you're telling a story that, that um, has no substance or the, it's got bits of substance, but those bits fall apart if you don't have the larger context in which people are living their lives. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, that's that's not an adequate response to the three comments, but thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and this is just so wonderful. I just can't refrain myself from jumping in to try to share a little bit my uh, reading experience. I just want to quickly mention two issues. One thing is, I was reading this while I was just sitting down there writing a paper, which is entitled Brain Anxiety. Brain anxiety over the northern Song state. So as you can tell, I'm writing about grain, I'm talking about the state, I'm talking about rebellion, food insecurity, all these issues. But to, towards the end, to my realization, everything come down to the cheapest, normally cheapest, the grain staple food, right? The uh, very very humble material, and yet that will lead to the huge anxiety, even at the state level, and in your story, lead to perhaps even contributing to the downfall of the dynasty. So what I'm thinking about when I was reading that and writing my own paper, I was thinking about this saying when we in Chinese say, tian, right? really, in a sense, is really the food here, the cheapest cheapest, the bulky, staple grain is the real heaven, not the abstract, abstract immaterial heaven, right? Constantly being going through this moralistic spin, right? You were talking about actually is the material grain. And I think for those of us, um, my colleagues here on the screen and myself as environmental historian, in one way or another, we're all going through this powerful, intellectual, powerful <laughs> Right, coming from the epistemology all the way down to the ontological level, the material things, they could be so minute, they could be so insignificant, and yet they do exist. They do matter. And how exactly the material being matter is very important. And I think your book show us is how to go down to the bottom, to the everyday life, to ordinary human beings, and see how the material encounter actually took place between the human valley, right, to this region, to from one human society, to the large scale a imperial empire. How to build this word, uh, I think Ian mentioned, build a kind of pathway to show the material level encountering inter, uh, encounters and interaction to build those pathways, so important. But I found, myself found that you, you did such a great job by excavating those sources at the local level. And the second thing I really wanted to mention very briefly is to echo this quotation that Clark actually called out, which is on page 168, that is the next to the last page of your book. And I really like this line, so I wanna re just read it out. If the ghost of environmental determinism lingers just outside of my analytical door, it is not a ghost I am prepared to deny. Many hands were on deck when the Chongzhen slough struck. Not all of them incompetent, but they were so uh, they were as overwhelmed by the scale of environmental stress as we've been inattentive to it until recently. And I really like this line, actually responded to several issues my colleagues are bringing up, right? And we work on environmental issue, climate issue. We always reach, we walk on this fine line in terms of climate determinism, geographical determinism, and environmental determinism. But here is, will that fear actually stop us from, from dressing and touching upon the real issue that is happening? How to negotiate that fine line? I think that is skillful work we have to do. But we cannot shy away from at least try to walk that line. So yes. thank well, you for writing who, the book. Who, whoever coined the term environmental determinism um, has done no one any favors, mm -hmm. because I think most of us, uh, very few of us are environmental determinists. Mm -hmm. uh, very few of us are geographical determinists, but you leave out geography, you leave out climate, you leave out the environment, and you're just, um, you're, 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 you're dancing on air. 
you're, there's no substance underneath uh, the propositions that you're making, or you revert to these, if I can phrase it this way, traditional narratives that cultures create to explain themselves on what are basically moral principles rather than on material principles. Mm -hmm. And that's not, it's not good enough mm -hmm. from my perspective. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now we're gonna open the floor for discussion. Peter. Yeah. So um, I'm probably on the idealist side versus her materialist side with one exception. <laughs> I'm a geographic terminist. <laughs> no, um, in memory of Bill Skinner. Um, yeah. The uh, to what extent is this story uh, a North China history? I, I I mean, in fact, one of the one of the one of the the three commentators raised the problem of ge geographical specificity, and that's something that somebody should do. I'm not going to do it. Um, I'm too old for this. Uh, but if somebody wanted, <laughs> but if somebody wanted to go sort of region by region through China and look at how prices were 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 being distorted, that could be real instructive. Um, and I wouldn't say it's a North China Plain story because I find this story is being repeated in places all over the country. Um, at the same time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the other thing is um, the, the, the Chinese system of appointing magistrates is such that magistrates are being sent all over the country from uh, not to their native places. And you get magistrates coming up with solutions like incentivize the merchants to bring in grain from another province somewhere. And merchants are doing and are, me, magistrates are doing this during the main to try and offset um, these 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 tremendous prices that they're having to face. So there is a kind of um, it's almost a, a kind of administrative culture on the national okay. level that is seeking to respond to this. But at some point, um, the, the the scale of the need is just better, far more huge than the administrative response is able to respond to. But yes, it would be interesting to see to 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 do a more regional analysis. Um, I've noticed I've hard have hardly any data from Guangdong and Guangxi. Um, those areas just kind of fall off because the the gazetteers are not reporting uh, famine crisis. I don't know why. And maybe that's a local cultural thing, or maybe it's they're not having that. So it's, if you take a, I've seen a map that looks at famine flood. Yeah, through the Ming Dynasty. Yeah. And it's a map, it's a time series. Yeah. So it, yeah, it's right. popping, popping right. up in different places. Right. right. So you'd expect each one of those places to be hit by price change. I think one of the great strengths that we've done is to identify a stable price change mm -hmm. as a fundamental factor. Mm -hmm. um, we would expect that to be happening whenever, to some extent, whenever there is a famine. Right. Sure. So yeah. it, it should be doable. Yeah. yeah. But and, and so why I've sort of stuck to the record in the local gazetteers is that I wanted to see how is this reported at the local level. Yeah, yeah. Some local areas don't report the crisis in this way. Many local areas do, and that that requires yet another level or, or another layer of analysis that um, I didn't get around to. Um, well. Well, let's see where to begin. I, I should say I haven't yet read your book, but I will I look forward to it because they have all this stimulating conversation. Um, getting back to the area that I've studied around Shaoxing, um, in the 1640s, um, there was a great strength, strong sense of human agency and what could be done yes. about famine shortages. Um, Including, I mean, Chi Biajia mentions how uh, his ink froze and snow was heavy and so on and so forth. They were very much in the midst of what you had called the cruel yes. ice age. Um, but there are so many means by which they manipulate, not manipulate, but maneuver um, prices. You mentioned in asking merchants to import grain. And it wasn't just the magistrates' initiative, but mm -hmm. a lot of local initiatives. 
granaries. And sure. there's no mention of granaries. There were a lot of private granaries and there were local granaries. Um, and then how do you release it? Do you right. give discounts and so on? And all these terminologies um, that I've not sufficiently mastered, but perhaps you have on equalizing prices. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just wondering how that fits into your chapter. Right. Well, um, as you start with the uh, notion that um, bad climate is heaven sent. And I'm aware in contrast of this um, feeling of human agency. And also I might add in the 1640s, they did not want to repeat the 1580s. They were very aware of how different the 1580s. Yeah, and so that, that famine in the 1580s became a kind of benchmark for, for people subsequently. Well, in fact, I've read Chibiel Jia's diary through the 1640s. It's a wonderful source. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't dwell, uh, didn't use it as much as I as I could have. But yes, he's 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 always trying to come up with solutions to to the problems he's facing. He then go, goes to Nanjing and is is possibly going to be a, a major figure in the new regime, and he is for a while, and then things don't turn out so well. Um, and he mentions a lot of brain crisis. Yes, but yes. it's not only Chibiad, there were others. Yeah, yeah. Um, the issue of granaries is 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 for me a difficult one because in my earlier work, I found that the, by the middle of the Ming, the granaries had pretty much stopped functioning, and. Um, it's you can find evidence of county granaries operating. You have certainly have private granaries as well, but documenting that in any consistent way is really difficult. Mm -hmm. You might might get a reference to a granary somewhere in Wujian County, mm -hmm. but it's not enough of a reference to build to build much of an argument on. And um, it's not to say that that research wouldn't be fruitful to do, but it's mm -hmm. it's nothing that I, 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 I found very little reference to um, state administered granaries um, in this period. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, gra the, the granaries that we know about, they were being emptied and the grain was being sent up to the northern border to feed the troops. And this is Shandong's particular problem. It's being emptied out of grain stores in order to support the army. I, so I guess my point is maybe just the actual brain crisis is a start yeah. because there are all these other things that can move the crisis. Um, yes. Mm. Um, but uh, that'll take a lot of research right. on someone's part, and I invite them to do it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to quickly mention that the clerk Ian and Ian sitting there, and I can see you. If you want to jump in, raise your hand. I can see you. Then you can jump in. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I encourage those of us who, when you raise your question, you can quickly mention your name and what you do uh, very quickly so we know who you are, uh, who are you, you are. Hi. I'm a employee. I am a client. I'm a Not a Chinese follower. A uh, couple questions. First of all, are there other records that you could use to strengthen the argument? So, for example, census data or tax records. And also, I agree with Ian here that there may be other uh, proxies for change. Uh, even pollen data could tell us something about how the climate is changing and maybe something about agricultural as well. Yes, and Chinese scientists have been using those physical proxies to do to do their analysis. I don't bring that literature in very much in this book. I just sort of leave it there. <laughs> Not anybody who wants to go to it can can go to it. Documentary proxies. It's it's much more difficult because we don't have the nice thing about gazetteers is that they continue to be printed and survive into the present. Things like tax records. Um, haven't survived, so we we can't we can't go back to those documents in any sort of consistent way. And uh, by relying on the gaz the gazetteers provide a kind of 
a, a measure of consistency to to uh, to the to the proxy that I'm I'm having okay. like that. And I haven't been able to find anything else in gazetteers that would work as well as a proxy for climate change. But it's it's uh, it's worth thinking about. Um, I, and I'm not sure quite how I would go about it. Mark. Mark Elliott, uh, Tim, thanks so much. Uh, you hopefully uh, portrayed uh, Dorban here as a finger waving moralizer. <laughs> so I'll take this me away. And, oh, no, no, he's, no, a, he's a political <laughs> propagandist. <laughs> Trump should hire him. <laughs> the, and I, 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 I haven't read the book yet, but I look forward to it. Uh, the argument, as I understand, is that you must say the being fell because there wasn't enough food, and there wasn't enough food because of climate change. My question is uh, was it the cold? Or was it the lack of water that led to the failure of um, agriculture in different parts of the country? Well, that that overall, I see it's the the conjunction between colder temperatures and lack of water. That's what's that's what's destroying the agricultural economy. How those play out, I mean, uh, how those play out depending is going to be different depending on the part of China you're in, the the the, the crops you're growing. And I didn't take my analysis doesn't go down to that level. I'm I'm sort of looking at the aggregate here. I'm just trying to from the aggregate of what's going going on in China. Um, I ask in the in your in the gazetteers that you're looking at, where where people complaining, this sort of this is very a very crude metric, of course, but were they complaining more about the fact that oh my gosh it's so cold my ink is freezing, or are they complaining <laughs> oh my gosh it's so dry. Uh, I can't. Uh, there's no water to, 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 to water well, the um, they, Is there more of one than the other, or is it? Oh, oh, definitely more. More in terms of the lack of precipitation. There's. It's very difficult to. Um, you ha you have to go into the BG of local writers, and that's where you discover somebody saying, "It's June and there's snow on the ground," uh, because there is no metric that any gazetteer author is using to say, ooh, it got really cold that year, Ex except very, very occasionally that might come up in, the, in a price change. But there isn't the sense that cold is a factor. The sense is that drought is the factor. But, I, but as I put it all together, it seems to me that um, you, can, you can modify uh, planting and harvesting practices in relation to one of these problems, but doing it when you're facing both of these problems, it's just insurmountable. So do we know how to say double whammy in Chinese? Uh, yeah. Uh, shuang. Shuang zai. <laughs> shuang zai. Okay, we'll, 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 we've coined a new phrase. <laughs> Can I jump in with a question? Okay. Do you know if there's phenological data like on the dates of tree flowering or or things like this, because this strikes me as another thing. I, I don't know if it would be consistent, but this would be another uh, proxy for climate. Um, that would be a great proxy, but I have not seen, uh, I mean, you could get fragments of it here and there, but uh, if only you, if you can only find 10 references, it's not a data set. Um, and, uh, I think Chinese climate scientists are trying to uh, dredge this stuff up out of the bottoms of lakes and ponds, but uh, that's still an ongoing kind of research. Yeah, I just asked because my understanding is that there's fairly good data from Tokugawa from like, you know, that covers like 150 years or something. And so it's conceivable that... Uh... Um, Japan has this kind of data um, Chinese were not keeping this this sort of data. Yeah. And I wanted to uh, bring some attention to our online audience. Mm -hmm. We, um, I can see something here. Obviously, we can project this online so everybody can see. So I'm just going to ask Tim maybe to uh, start with the first one. Take a look. Okay. Oh, not. <laughs> COVID did not um, I, I wasn't aware that I was making any kind of connection between COVID 
and the presentation. It was raised by a few others of you here Peter. in the room, but the, uh, the, uh, yes. <laughs> um, the audience can't read those questions. No. Oh, oh, right. oh. oh, the audience can't read the question. So hello, audience. So we are talking about, we're looking at the one um, comment asking, COVID did not affect the supply of grains. There was a never shortage of grain during COVID. How, why do you try to make a connection between COVID and the presentation we just heard? Okay, Ian, you took blame. <laughs> That's a criticism of me. And that was more just a comment about how people freaked out about price changes in general and price changes that were on the order of, you know, maybe a few, um, like a few dozen percent. Um, it wasn't about grains in particular. And um, yeah. Okay, let's move on then. Next question. Yeah. Are there any core and appropriate relationships between different regions in China when it comes to price of volatility? For example, would the rising food or textile prices in one region be beneficial to another region that produces them or have them in abundance since there is now a arbitrary uh, opportunity mm -hmm. for profit? Well, the, my quick answer to that would be that there are, when you've got a regional crisis, then the region can draw on, on, on resources from other regions. But when the crisis is spread right across the country, um, there's no arbitrage profits to be had from moving grain from, from Hunan to Hebei if there's no grain in Hunan. So, um, so yes, I mean, uh, for a, if you were going to do, write the history of a particular region, through its uh, climate experiences in the Ming Dynasty, this would be a factor that, that would be worth bringing in. But as I say, what I'm what I tried to do in the book is just draw uh, draw the big picture. Not I I, I I I didn't get specific, but you I I do mention a couple of times in the book magistrates bringing in grain mm -hmm. from other parts of the country. So a, a magistrate in Fujian is 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 getting merchants in Zhejiang to send grain down the coast. In order to relieve his family, so that that is in fact mm -hmm. um, uh, evidence of, of of what the questioner is suggesting. Mm -hmm. But when it's on this scale and extending beyond, I mean, two years is sort of the maximum that an agricultural economy can stand having no grain harvests. Mm -hmm. But once it goes beyond two years, um, the, yeah. these methods, yeah. And we cannot Goodbye. also forget about the issue we're talking about droughts, lack lack of rainfall, lack of water yeah. supply, and for main empire heavily relied on water based transportation. And uh, because I work on issue of flood water control, yeah. so this was a serious issue. Yeah. Where do we get additional water to pump it into the Grand Canal so the ships can, the right. boats can float? Right. And this was a problem that Chi Biao Jia had. He was traveling around. Jiangnan in his mm -hmm. canal and had to get out, uh, yeah. out of his barge because there was no water in the, yeah. to float the, yeah. Float yeah. the barge. Right. And it directly related to your books, speaking about the downfall of the dynasty, especially the military garrison and the troops in the north. Mm -hmm. Most of them heavily relied on long distance water based transportation, uh, the, the water based uh, mm -hmm. grain shipping from South China, right? So this is directly related to the the basic the military action is out there. So that is far more uh, very important for um uh, for the uh, survival of the dynasty. Um next point uh, from Erling Ag Ag I'm sorry Agri. Agri. <laughs> I thank the professor broker for excellent talk and intriguing research. I want to ask if you could say something more on to what extent to the famine prize foundings can be applied in the main states, different regions. Well, mm -hmm. uh, we for example, in border areas or areas with the different climate conditions, are there multiple areas and not covered adequately by the data? All right, well, I'll start by saying, hello, Erling. He, I, he's worked with me in the past. Um, <laughs> uh, the short answer is gonna be yes. Um, we really, the data on the Western provinces is really scanty. Um, so uh, you couldn't do this for Sichuan or Guizhou or Yunnan. Um, there's a high rate of re reporting along the Great Wall among the military units, 
But that's because that was captured by um, officials reporting the problems of feeding the troops along the Great Wall. And the, the degree to which the shortages in the north and the northeast is endemic to the local market or a problem of the lack of supply from elsewhere in the country is difficult to put together. But, um, and as, as I said in my, in my response to Peter earlier, I haven't done the regional analysis. And that would be the next step, I would say, uh, to be done with this, with, 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 with the, the, the propositions that I put forward, that we need to move this down to a regional analysis because China isn't one place. As, as you know, as we all know, China is not mm -hmm. one place, it is many places. Okay. Well, let's just move the scroll down. Um, um, I would like to, oh. to read the rest of two uh, questions so then we can shift back mm -hmm. to our in-person uh, room. So the next question, since we can't see each other, mm -hmm. oh, can you let us know who is speaking? Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> right now, Lee. Um, um, yes, um, here we are. So the next question, there is a good correlation between inflation and increases in grain prices and shortages and the climate change. Could you comment on that correlation? Well, I think in a basic agricultural economy, the correlation between inflation and grain prices is insignificant. It may affect grain prices I mean, in, maybe instead of paying four fun, you're pay, paying six fun. Instead of paying 30 copper coins, you're paying 40 copper coins, especially when the copper coins start getting debased and so forth. So there, there is a little bit of that going on. But one of the arguments I try and make in the book, and I, I use, I mean, it's it's pretty, it would, um, if I took, if I presented this in an economic history seminar, I, they, they'd kick me out of the room. But I, I, I argue that there's not good evidence of inflation. There's a slow inflation through the Ming, but there's not good evidence of uh, inflation that will be strong enough to drive prices to the levels that they are driven by other factors. And I, I address this a little bit in, um, I guess it's the fifth chapter. I forgot exactly. Yeah, I think it's in the fifth chapter. In fact, I address this a little bit. And I, I use a couple of price lists. I look at change of prices over through the course of the Ming. And I'm not convinced that there's anything but the, a, a very mild rate of inflation through the Ming Dynasty. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, our online audience, for your questions. And can we shift back to our in class? Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm here with my name is Holman Park. I'm a PhD student at Harvard studying the history of natural disasters in the Ming Qing period. And my question is about the people's perception of the climate changes or natural disasters, which means like, for example, from the perspective of people who were living in the Jing Tai Slo, mm -hmm. did they or whether or to what extent they were self-aware of the, you know, something really extraordinary is going on in their time period? Or were those disasters or climate changes were just like given constant and unfortunate conditions that they have to deal with like over and over again? Well, this is in fact a question that Erling Agoy is working on. He's trying to see to what extent were, were local people formulating an idea about what was happening to them. And he's finding some of that in the 17th century, but mostly in the Zhangnan area. Go back to Jingtai, the overwhelming crisis is the, the fact that the Mongols captured the emperor and the Mongol army is just sitting right there at the Great Wall and then comes in and surrounds Beijing. So the, the, for them, the crisis is, it's a military defense crisis. And uh, I have not found any writer in the Jingtai area reflecting on questions of drought or or lower temperatures. I just haven't felt it. But once we get down into the Chongzhen era, well, so, I mean, this is why I start the book with uh, um, Chen Qi De, because Chen Qi De is saying, there's, there's no, I, I can't, I go to the riverbed and there, I can't scoop out a, I can't get a scoop of water out of the riverbed anymore. And th there's a kind of bafflement. And for Chen, who's trained as, in good neo Confucian morality, for Chun, his only answer is um, 
we really messed up and we have brought this upon ourselves. And that's the, and, and until people go back to behaving in a properly moralistic fashion, we're not going to get out of the, this, this, this climate change. But he has no way, uh, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't have the tools to conceptualize what is happening to him, except through the agency of Tian. And, um, but I, I think uh, Erling's work as it comes along will, will show us that it's, it's a little more complex. We have time for one more last question. Uh, anyone else? Just just a moment. Okay, great. Please. Um, uh, yes. So my question is, I'm, I'm a scientist, theoretically. Um, I'm thinking about how people kept warm. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that they were cold because the wood was not so plentiful anymore. I'm not sure. I'm wondering what that did to the air quality, whether the it suffered from air pollution and what that could have done to weaken people's immunity and so on. That would be a great topic to look at. <laughs> I've seen no particular reference to it. Um, a little bit in, on the North China Plain or, or up in the Beijing area where epidemics get going because of, oh, well, not because of climate change, but in conjunction with climate change, there are epidemics that tear through villages and uh, with, with, uh, with mortality rates exceeding 50%. Um, one could think of, yes, the impact of temperature on the ability of a household to survive through those conditions. Um, but I, it's not something I've encountered in my, in my well, reading We know that there's a correlation yeah. that, that breathing those particles gives uh, bodies yeah. to systemic inflammation yeah. within the body yeah. and yeah. disease. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the, the incident, well, the incidence of, of epidemics in the North seems it struck me just subjectively as stronger in the north than it is in further south in China. Mm -hmm. But that would be an interesting topic to pursue further. Yeah. Actually, the uh, echoing that question, when I was looking at the paintings that you show mm -hmm. on the screen, I kept thinking about what kind of clothes did people wear in those yeah. days? And they were so lucky that right? cotton became so widely cultivated. You imagine if you yes. go back to Yuan or go back to Song Dynasty, something like this happened. You didn't have cotton, right? What kind of clothes you, you people mm -hmm. wore hemp, right? Mm -hmm. That would be really hard to keep you keep warm. Mm -hmm. So anyway, we have time for one last comment, please. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jason Chen. Um a PhD candidate at the uh, history department of here. Um, sort of question, um, uh, sort of tying sort of the discussion that we had uh, in this room. So I'm sort of wondering the relative importance of sort of the uh you know, the little ice age, its transporter sort of uh, impact on the on northern Eurasia and sort of bringing uh, as you mentioned, whether the uh, judges but also other um uh, sort of empires down towards um, and then sort of creating a, a continuum of war in for the main state. Is, uh, and that's really more related to sort of the, the sun dip in temperature and cold. Yeah. Whereas in China, it's sort of more of a problem of lack of precipitation that these two sort of bring supply issue. Um, do that, in that sense, how does the two sort of uh, synthesize in, in dealing to in the price class? Whereas domestically, it's really about lack of precipitation dealing to for grain supply, but also on the other hand, that grain should also go into war, whether on northern. So frontier uh, with people who who, who migrate in south precisely because of cold climate, mm -hmm. uh, but also let's say just and along southwest is along the war um, along the coast as well. So so how does it relate? Uh, you know the domestic sort of side, but also mm -hmm. the war sort of period. Well, it, it's certainly another another aspect to the history uh, to the history of this period. Um, I I could only speculate. Um, I mean the, the the Manchus were running short of grain. And the cold, te colder temperatures were pushing them south towards China, and they also, um, I would say, probably were very adept at manipulating the circumstances among the Mongol groups with with whom they had relations, and were, if you like, uh, riding riding a wave that allowed them to conquer to assert their control over the Mongol areas 
north of the Great Wall, as well as China, the south. But I would defer to Mark on this if he wanted to weigh, weigh in on I'm, I'm not going to speculate on speculation. I think we should. <laughs> <laughs> Well, with that, I think we should bring the event to conclusion. Thank you, Professor Tim.